From the UNBC Event Center in Baltimore, Maryland, it's America East Conference Men's Basketball on ESPN3. Today, it's the Vermont Catamounts taking on the UNBC Retrievers. And alongside John Feinstein, I'm Gary Stein, welcoming you into the Event Center and welcome in to round two of this heavyweight title bout. John, winner between UNBC and Vermont has home court throughout the tournament. Exactly right. Even though Vermont has a one game lead after their win here last night, if UMBC were to win the rematch this evening, they would get the number one seed. The teams would tie for the regular season title, but UMBC would get home court, as you said, throughout the playoffs. And that's even bigger than usual this year because those first two teams are going to get a double bye and not play before the semifinals. Round one went to you uh, to uh, Vermont last night, 80-71 the final. And Steph Smith, the shooting guard, was a big reason why. He was unreal. Six out of seven from three. And here you see him making a step back, which college kids aren't supposed to make. Here he makes one from just inside the C on UMBC. You just couldn't give him space there. Dmitry Spazievich with his six foot nine inch long arms is out there with a hand up and he still swishes it. Those three guys, they are the big three for Vermont. Look at those numbers, not just the combined 61 points, but they shot 22 of 36 as a trio from the field. UMBC is going to have to do a better job guarding them tonight. And for UMBC, they've been strong in the paint, John, all year long. They're going to need some more of that tonight. They absolutely will. And they've got to get a big game from Brandon Horvath. You see his numbers last night. Played all 40 minutes, seven points, which is almost eight under his average. Three out of 11 from the field. Did not get to the free throw line. They did a tremendous job guarding him inside. He missed a lot of close-in shots. It looked a little off balance. He's got to be UMBC's best best player this evening if they're going to win this game. Simple as that. If you look at the historical record between the two schools, it's 36-8 Vermont. That's a little misleading considering the last three years these teams have met in the conference uh, tournament each, each year. Yeah, and of course UMBC won that game uh, in 2018, breaking a 23-game losing streak against Vermont. The buzzer beater by Jarris Lyles, and then they took that win to Charlotte, where they pulled the greatest upset in the history of the NCAA tournament. I can see the banner right now. 74-54 over Virginia. 20-point historic win. I'm sure we'll catch that a little bit later this afternoon. Of course, uh, as you know, this year with the back-to-back -back games, UNBC, even though they're the home team in the road black, Vermont is the technical home team in the home white. And a turnover here for the Catamounts on possession number one. Yeah, rare unforced error for Vermont. You don't see that very much. Last night, they only had 10 turnovers, and the Retrievers only had eight. But... For Vermont shot the ball so well, that was the difference in the in the basketball game. Starting five for UNBC, RJ Idlerock with a huge game last night, 23 points. He's got 54 points in his last two games against Vermont. Spazojevic with a little leaner off the baseline. That is no good. Vermont with the rebound and the quick turn up ahead. This is Steph Smith now from outside straight away, wow. who continues his run. Picking up where he left off last night. He's now seven for eight on this court in the last 24 hours. That's a pretty good run for anybody. Seven for eight from out from the three-point line. The key matchup this afternoon, though, is going to be Ryan Davis as LJ Owens matches a three. Just to finish the thought, Ryan Davis inside for Vermont. Brandon Horvath with him. Although Isaiah Powell guarded Horvath a good deal of the time last night and did an outstanding job on it. Well, every player on the Vermont team is, uh, and there's Ryan Davis from outside. See, and he's not supposed to be shooting threes. He was the one guy on the team who didn't shoot threes well last night. He was just one out of six. But he starts out today one out of one. Davis missed the first two games this year. They split with Albany, and John Becker, the head coach, said they're a much different team with Davis in the lineup. They could play inside-outside as Horvath misses a three here for UMBC. Yeah, he misses a three, but that's not necessarily a bad sign for UMBC because in the first half last night, Brandon Horvath barely touched the basketball. There's Davis now putting to the floor. Ben Shungu, what a great story he is. All and right. again, a turnover here for Vermont. Now, I thought maybe maybe uh, UMBC got a break there because I thought Spazievich had deflected the ball, but no argument from Shungu. So he was closer to the play than I was. That's two quick turnovers for the Catamounts who lead the league in least turnovers per game. That's sort of a Vermont tradition among many. 
It's a reason why they've been the dominant team in this league for so many years, dating back to Tom Brennan. Spasojevic now 0 for 2 from the field. Davis pulls it down. Shungu all the way to the basket and in. Shungu is such a good inside outside player. If you leave him space to shoot the three, he'll make it. If you let him put the ball on the floor like there, he'll make it too. And Idle Rock, who had a big game last night, gets to the basket and gets fouled. Defended by Isaiah Powell, the 6'6 junior from Albany, New York. Let's take a look at the foul. See, Idle Rock is also very good going to the basket, and there you see got him on the arm, and thus two free throws for Idle Rock. UMBC is going to need to shoot free throws better today than they did last night. 11 out of 18, whereas Vermont, which didn't shoot a free throw in the first half, was 12 out of 12. And they're the best shooting uh, free throw shooting team in the conference. Idle Rock with the first shot here. Phil Jackson always said, as I'm sure you know, uh, if a team's got three scoring threats, they're almost impossible to defend. Well, the three who had 20 apiece last night for Vermont have each scored in this game today. Well, and what Ryan Odom said to me this morning was, we've got to make their other guys beat us today. They didn't make the, their other guys beat them yesterday. Again, 61 points combined out of, out of 80. And there's, there's a, a foul away screen. from the ball, yeah. Same three officials here today as yesterday. Earl Walton, John Floyd, Mike Kitts. That one on he, Davis, of course, yeah, as you he, see clearly. He was that wasn't even one of those where, oh, he just moved <laughs> a little. He was a man in motion. Yeah, oh, I, I was about oh, to say he was about to run a pattern like a tight end. Well, John Becker did not like that call, and he's not a big whiner on the sidelines normally. Here's Shungu with Horvath. Again, that's, that's two shots now for Horvath. And both good shots, they just didn't go in. He's got to keep shooting. Shungu with a fantastic game all along the floor. Nice now. pass. Good inside from Missoula. Powell with the assist, and right now Vermont by five. Justin Missoula, of course, played three years at George Washington. Brother Joe played at West Virginia and is now the basketball coach at Fairmont State. Of course, his dad, Dan, also quite a player, played at Bryant yep. College in Rhode Island, in case you didn't know that. Idle Rock with the miss. One and done here for the Retrievers. Here comes Smith the other way. Vermont clearly the class of the America East, and they've been that way for the last 20 years. And that's three turnovers, not good turnovers at all, for Vermont. A little surprising. John Becker said he was concerned as every coach who wins the first of these back-to-backs has to be about UMBC coming out with an edge to them. Well, to Vermont's credit, they've come out with the edge, even though they've made some careless turnovers. The Retrievers now with substitutions. Dan Aachen in for Dmitry Spazajevic. Keandre Kennedy in for LJ Owens. They were a big key yesterday, John. When they came in the game early, they cut into that 13-point lead that Vermont they had They sure early. did. It was 17-4. Dan Aachen came in and made back-to-back -back baskets inside, and that started the rally that led to UMBC actually having a lead in the first half before being down by one at halftime. Kennedy picks it another off inside, bad, another bad. turnover. That one intended for Powell. Here's Kennedy, a little soft jumper off glass and in. I, I wonder if he wa wanted the bank there. It didn't, almost didn't looked look like, like it. Yeah, well, it was a clean bank, let's put it that way. Kennedy's first two, he had 11 yesterday, including nine in the first half. The transfer from Lebet Community College. Nice ball nice movement pass. here, and Powell converts from Smith. They're feast or famine so far. Either they throw a beautiful pass or they throw, they throw the ball away. You're right, absolutely right. They're five for five from the field with five turnovers. Rest my case, Your Honor. <laughs> I think I'm going to rule in your favor. <laughs> Here's Rogers for three. And uh, obviously that's a good sign for UMBC. He made a couple threes in the first half yesterday. It looked like he might be getting going, but then he didn't make another field goal the rest of the game. And they need him to make those shots from outside, not just because of the points, but because it opens things up for the other guys. Davis with Aachen, good matchup here. Davis averaging 19 per game, rejected by Aachen. Aachen is quick enough to stay with Davis there. It's the first block of the weekend, by the way. Neither team had a block last night, which is amazing. I thought they were going to call a foul on Powell underneath, but not. Called an offensive foul here. on Aachen. 
It is the first foul on Aachen, and we'll take it to break. 14-18 left in the first half, just getting underway here at the Event Center, and a good one brewing. It's for all the marbles in the America East. Back after this. Hercules tires are meant to dig dirt, sling mud, and pound pavement to get you safely to your destination. See what tires are right for you by visiting HerculesTires.com. Hercules Tires, the official tire of the America East Conference, ride on our strength. And what a long, strange season it's been in general in college basketball, John, but especially so for Vermont in the America East. Yeah, no question. I mean, John Becker has always built his program around tough non-conference schedules, playing ranked teams. They didn't get to play any non-conference games this season. Their first game was December 21st, and it was an America East game. They lost to, they got off to a two or three start. Two of those losses by one point. As you see, eight and oh since then, back where they normally are in first place. They lost Anthony Lamb, two-time America East player of the year, two other starters, and yet here they are playing for first place the way they all they always do in the in the America East. And John Becker said November and December were really tough. Uh, being in Burlington, playing no games. The players were there over Thanksgiving, but no games to play, and they played their first two games just before Christmas and then couldn't even go home for Christmas. That's a rough road. There's no coach anywhere that has had the success like John Becker has had in his first nine years at Vermont. Never won less than 20 games. He will this year, but just be that's because they're not going to play a total of 20 games. Ball in for the Catamounts. They lead it by two. Thomas Murphy, a transfer from Northeastern, has checked into the game. Here's Missoula now inside along the elbow. Good defense by UMBC. Missoula has to back out. That was a good defensive possession for UMBC. Murphy. Murphy made three, five three-pointers a week ago against Stony Brook, but he was very quiet last night and he missed that first three. Murphy also from a basketball family. His dad, Jay Murphy, played in the NBA for a few seasons, and his brothers played big-time college basketball. And who was Jay Murphy's college coach? Jay Murphy's college coach? You got me. Yeah, Gary Williams. Gary, Boston, Gary college. Boston College, right. There's Hawking underneath. Late, and late whistle there. Looked like a foul, but for a second, I thought there was going to be no call. Great look by Rogers inside for Hawking. Yeah, nice pass in the lane by Rogers. He has such good vision. Perhaps because he's so close to the floor. <laughs> well, that is possible. The shortest man in college basketball, as I'm sure most of our viewers know by now. Dad was Shantae Rogers, not Shanta, as the ESPN guys called him last night. Good call. Great player at GW. Hawken was two out of three from the free throw line last night, but zero for two here. That's a wasted opportunity for UMBC, who still trailed by two. Much better start, obviously, for the Retrievers, as you would expect. You wouldn't expect them to get in a 17-4 hole like they did last night. Robin Duncan, the third of three brothers on the floor now for Vermont. Smith with a miss. Tipped out, though, and the Catamounts will maintain. That's Powell, not, a, that's not a backcourt violation, as some of the Retrievers were calling for, because it was off a missed shot. Here's Murphy. New shot clock turning quickly on his defender, and Idle Rock comes away with it for UMBC. Here's Aachen now with Murphy. He Aachen can make that move, it. he's so good going to his right. He had a big impact uh, yesterday also, along with Kennedy. Well, especially early in the game when he came in at, when it was 17-4, when UMBC couldn't make anything. Ryan Odom had to call an early timeout. And he got in his players' faces and said, look, they're playing their butts off. You've got to match that. And they did. They, they rallied. Hawkins stays with Duncan. He didn't say butts, by the way. <laughs> Warbath on Smith nice out there. Nice drive, but he couldn't finish. Warbath pulls it down with authority. Needs to do that more for UMBC. Needs to you use the phrase with authority. Here's Horvath on the offensive end. Still can't buy it. It'll stay with UMBC. Vermont, John, was five for their first five. Now they're O for their last five. Now, last night's game was a game of runs, too, so we can expect the same tonight. 11.47 left in the first half. Brandon Horvath. The Retrievers are going to need him big time tonight. Tied at 12. 
Back at you here from the event center, tied at 12 with 11.47 left in the first half. While Vermont was the class of the conference and has been, John, for the last 20 years, UMBC really struggled for a period of seven years from 09 until 16. And in April of 16, they hired Ryan Odom, and he has turned it around. Totally turned it around. They had averaged seven wins a year for that stretch that you mentioned, Gary. Ryan Odom has won 96 games in a little under five years. Do the math. That means they're averaging at least 19 wins a year. If they can win today and then win the conference tournament, he'd be at 99 going into the NCAA tournament. I know I'm getting way ahead of myself, but worst case scenario, worst case, we're talking 19 plus wins a year so far. That's pretty darn good given where they were when he took over. Son of Dave Odom, of course, great coach in the ACC back in the day, and now the son, Ryan Odom, the savior of the moment for the UNBC basketball program. And Dave Odom likes nothing more than the fact that he's now referred to as Ryan Odom's dad. dad. A foul on the inbounds pass called by Earl Walton. Outstanding veteran official. Mike Kitts, one of the other officials, is the son of Mike Kitts, who refed in numerous Final Fours. Hawken again goes strong to the hoop, and he's fouled. Nick Fiorillo, who had just checked in, a 6'7 sophomore, gets the first foul on the inbounds, and let's see who gets this one. Yep, looks like it'll be on Fiorillo again. Yeah. Fiorillo, a, a walk-on, uh, who will, John Becker tells me, be scholarship next year. Much, much like Ben Shungu, who arrived at Vermont as a walk-on. What a great story. And, you know, it's an, early, it's an early substitution for uh, Fi Fiorello. Yeah, I, I don't, I'm not sure Fiorello played last night. i got to look at the box score here. Uh, he, he didn't play last night. No, and, he did. And I'll tell you what else. Ryan Davis has gotten an unusual amount of time off here in the first half so far. Well, again, John Becker said to me that he was a little concerned about his team keeping up its energy level. There's one of those touch fouls I hate. Two early turnovers for Davis in this game may have contributed to that. I hate it when they call a foul, a touch foul, when the, the ball handler has gone past the defender. Let the guy play. But that's the way the NCAA wants it officiated. Last night, first half was terrific. Nine fouls total. And then in the second half, the officials started calling every touch foul, and both teams were in the one and one with 10 minutes plus left in the game. Retrievers in the lead by two. Good defense again here from Idle Rock. Bounces out of bounds, and Vermont's got to recognize they only have four left on the clock. Every team has a play for this situation. They work on these situations at the end of practice every day. Four seconds, one second, six. This is four. I would expect to see a high ball screen here to try to set up a shot. There was the ball screen, but it didn't set up a shot. Boy. Smith has to just heave one. And a shot clock violation, another turnover against Vermont. But that was not unforced. That was good defense by UMBC. Those you can live with as a coach. UMBC did a really, they battened down the hatches defensively last night in the rest of the first half after falling behind early. They still played good defense in the second half, but Vermont was just on fire. They were on fire. Ryan Odom thought his team switched too much. They gave up on the, on the, on the screens and that created too many open shots. But they were not easy shots that Vermont made. I thought that Vermont was just, did a great job sh shooting the basketball. There's Robin, another turnover. Robin Duncan with a high pass intended for Missoula. And substitutions coming in for John Becker, but not Ryan Davis. As Shungu checks back in, along with Isaiah Powell. UMBC is on a 9-2 run here right now with the basketball. Rogers getting a screen from Horvath. Little step back inside the three-point line. He works on that step back all the time because he needs to to create space for himself. He's usually very good at it. Robin Duncan, what a great asset for John Becker coming off the bench to run the team. What a great asset the Duncan family has been. <laughs> Any more Duncans coming? Well, I asked John Becker that question because Robin Duncan is the third Duncan brother to play here. Patella with the three. Horvath pulls it down. I'm not sure that was the shot they wanted on that possession. 
But I said, do you have any more Duncans in the pipeline? Because, oh, that, that's a foul. Because there's been a Duncan on this team since 2014. First Ernie, then Everett, and now Robin. And he said, no, none left among the brothers, but I've encouraged the older two to start having families because I need their, their sons. Well, which means that Becker's going to stick around for a little while, perhaps. Well, I think perhaps. he's planning on it. I, I still don't understand why more teams haven't tried to hire him. Idle Rock at the free throw line after the foul by Patella. We were talking about this, you and I, before the game. This is such a well-coached league. Uh, these two guys, you look at what John Gallagher's done at Vermont. Um, there's you mean uh, Hartford? At, at Hartford. I'm thinking Vermont, obviously. John Gallagher's done amazing work at Hartford. They were in the championship game last year that never got played. And just, you know, Billy Herrian at, at New Hampshire is one of those guys that the general public knows nothing about. You ask any coach how good a coach he is, and they'll tell you. And for a long time, too. For a long time. With dating, many different programs. Dating back to his days at Drexel. Yep. The Malik Rose years. Not only made the NCAA tournament three times, they beat Memphis one year. Good tough defense again. here by UNBC again. Forces a tough shot by Shungu. It was a good shot Shungu got off against that defense. Just didn't go down. LJ Owens wheeling and dealing. That's good hands there. That'll be out of bounds off Patella. Yeah. Meanwhile, Patella, the Retriever's now up to a four-point lead. Patella did a good job breaking that pass up. Seven turnovers for Vermont. 11 minutes into the game. And they had 10 total last night, 40 minutes. UMBC with just one turnover so far. Triple down on Idle Rock, leaves Kennedy open for three. You can't leave Kennedy that open. He's too good a three-point shooter. He and LJ Owens, if you leave them open, they will, they will burn you. It's and a 12-0 run, John, over the last six minutes for UMBC. Yeah, Here's Davis back in the game, and Davis shuts it down. Don Becker knew he needed to get Davis back in that back in, get him a, a shot in the lane. UMBC had a one-point lead twice yesterday for a total of about 20 seconds. Yeah. Horvath with a floater. Maybe that will get Horvath going. Using he's quick at 6'10 because he was 6'2 in high school. He needs to use that quickness getting in the lane more often. And he needs to be physical around the rim, which he is. Well, last night he allowed himself to be pushed away. Like good defense in when he got the ball inside. Missed a lot of close in shots. Pull up by Shungu is too strong. John Becker told you we're not going to shoot as well tonight as we did yesterday. And after the five for five shot, that's the start. That's certainly been the case. They are one for ten. Good hands there by Aachen. Duncan over Aachen. Not even close. Bad miss. That was a wide right. Just barely grazed the rim. UMBC playing much better defense here than they did last night. Vermont just doesn't look adjusted, is how I'll term it. And they look, they're just not as sharp. They were really sharp last night. Pull up by Kennedy. John Becker might call a timeout here, yep. Nine point lead for UMBC with 7.05 left in the half. What a turnaround from last night. And it's been coming from all over the floor. Kennedy now with seven off the bench as the Retrievers have taken the lead. Well, the Vermont Catamounts haven't found themselves in this position in quite a while. The Retrievers lead Vermont by nine, 23-14. And a lot of that has to do, John, with Keandre Kennedy, who's come off the bench for the second time in two nights and had a big impact. Yeah, and Keandre Kennedy is, is like one of those six-man starters because of the minutes that he plays. He doesn't start, but he's, he usually plays 25 minutes a game. And here you see him making that bank shot and then the three. And then again, he's given a little space and scores again. So he's three for four from the field coming off the bench. Uh, LJ Owens has already made a three. They sort of combine minutes. So that's 10 points combined from the two of them in 13 minutes. 
that's a good start for that position on, on the floor for UMBC. But I really think the key to this lead, this 18-4 run, I, has been the defense because Vermont has been forced to use a lot of shot clock on a lot of possessions. And it's not unforced turnovers anymore, which it was early. They're just not getting very good shots because UMBC is forcing them to use so much shot clock. What a turnaround from two nights as Davis goes in on Aachen. Okay. Yesterday, Vermont led by 13 early. Now UMBC by nine in this one. And again, good defense again by Aachen. Guarding Davis very close, but not fouling. Davis just five points in this game at 21 last night. Retrievers now looking to make a double-digit lead here. Aachen with Davis. Can go to his, oh, he, went, he was gonna go to his left and Davis fouled him. That'll be personal foul number two on Davis. And Vermont's over the limit. So one and one for Aachen, which is always an adventure. Here you see, I think he surprised Davis going to his left and Davis reached with his left hand and committed the foul. Like I said, it's always an adventure with Dan Aachen at the free throw line. Missed the one and one. Aachen a 50% shooter coming into this series from the free throw line. Ryan Davis, Davis is second three. Davis, is, yeah, exactly. He's made two threes already in the first half. And maybe John Becker knew what he was doing, getting him some rest, because he certainly brought some energy to the court since he's come back in the game. He'd certainly be the, the odds-on favorite. Kennedy with a slice. Back to Davis real quick, John. Certainly the odds-on favorite for player of the year in the conference, I would think. Uh, Especially if Vermont wins tonight and they win the conference outright. Davis there he again, is again for three. He heard me doubting him. <laughs> that is, he was one for six last night from three. That was the only weakness really in Vermont's offense. And they were 10 for 21 overall from downtown. They're four of nine tonight, and Davis is three for three. Right, so the rest of the team won out of six. Here's Jacob Bunyaseth, who was checked in for UMBC with a miss. Ryan Odom said he wanted to get him some more minutes tonight. He only played 339 yesterday, and he is a good offensive weapon. Shungu like a truck barreling down the highway there. Drew the foul. He'll go to the line. That's a good call by you, because Shungu is built like a truck. And nobody, I, I assume that was on Owens. He did not establish position, and he did reach in. That is on Owens. That'll be the third on the team. Gives a look at Ben Shungu. What a great story he is, John. Amazing story. Uh, he came to Vermont as, as a walk-on. Uh, grew up in Burlington. John Becker knew him and basically told him, you're not good enough for me to offer you a scholarship right now. And nobody else offered him a scholarship. He came and walked on, redshirted as a freshman, played a little bit as a redshirt freshman, but played well enough that as a sophomore, John Becker scholarshiped him, and he's just gotten better and better and better. Defensive player of the year in the conference last year misses both. So just when we talk about how spectacular he was, he misses two free throws. An empty possession for Vermont. And as we said, Vermont doesn't usually miss free throws. They shoot close to 80%, and they were 12 for 12 last night. Spazoyevich back in the game, draws the double. Owens had a good night last night with a couple big threes. This is the guy who had the big night last night, though. Idle Rock. And let's see. They called an offensive foul, and I don't know if it was on the screen or who it was on. I think they're calling it on Owens. Uh, I guess they're saying he kicked, yeah, he kicked his leg out when he shot the ball. That's see, two quick ones on Owens. I'd like to see that one again. We, we don't. We do not, unfortunately, have a good replay angle, but pretty emphatic call there made by John Floyd. Well, not, not only that, but a pretty rare call. Yeah, you don't see that call very often at all. For like three seconds. Bad pass again. Smith misfires to Missoula. Here comes Owens all the way to the basket and in. And that's what Ryan Odom wants. When you get a live ball turnover, as the coaches call it, you want to attack, and that's exactly what Owens did there. Five points for the homegrown Owens. Left-hander by Smith won't go. 
And it's out of bounds off Vermont. And you'd have to say, at least in the first 16 minutes, UMBC doing a much better job on Smith and on Shungu, not on Davis. And there you see Owens just attacking off the, not so much a fast break, but a secondary break. Tight UMBC defense has contributed to Vermont shooting just three for their last 15. Yeah, no doubt. And a lot of times it's been late in the shot clock where they're taking a shot they don't really want to take. Here's Idle Rock, a little quiet this afternoon with four. But he hasn't had to be as involved as he was last night when nobody else could get going. Bunyasith. Bunyasith can be on instant offense. And that's why Ryan Odom wanted to get him some more minutes today. Yeah, usually he's a three-point shooter, no doubt. Got but he's only there. He'll go to the basket, though. He's kind of fearless. But he, he'll shoot it, no doubt. Davis for three. Had to miss one. That one was off balance. Retrievers lead back up to nine. Oh, which way is that going to go? I think they're going to call the block. No, no, it's on the other way. Called on an Idle offensive Rock. foul. And a timeout on the floor. We'll step aside here with 321 left in the half. UNBC trailed by 13 early last night and lost by nine. They lead by nine tonight. Back at you here with 321 left at the event center. Retrievers by nine. Let's take a look at that last offensive foul called on RJ Idlerock. Yeah, and this is one of those calls where if you watch it on replay, you will see the defender is Shungu is moving, but Idlerock with that big body puts his shoulder into Shungu, and I think that's why Earl Walton called it an offensive foul. And Shungu did a little bit of an acting job there. Those are two big bodies going up against one another, but Shungu smartly went backwards and got the call he wanted and there's no question not there's no question idle rock put his shoulder down there's also no question shungu was moving there's no question that rj idle rock has been a different player this season than in the last two for umbc well he's become so much more of an offensive force his shooting is is much much better he gets a squared up shot he's going to make it and he, he because of that big body we mentioned he can get in the lane uh, very effectively and had 22 points last night on a night when most of his teammates struggled offensively. Ball in for Vermont, trailing by nine. Again, in case you're joining us late, winner of this game gets home court throughout the America East Conference tournament, which begins next weekend. Neither of these teams will be playing next weekend. Though. They won't play for till two weeks from tomorrow when they will each host semifinals. A forced turnover by UNBC and a good dive by Rogers to pick it up. When it comes to getting on the floor, he does have an advantage. <laughs> you know, somehow I knew you were going there. Well, I know. It's, it's kind of predictable, too. I should probably stop. You are predictable. He's just so amazing, the way, the way he plays basketball at his size. Five to shoot for UNBC. Spazajevic turns around oh, that's and a scores. Bonus. That may be the longest shot he's made all season. And he took the shot because the shot clock was down. Foul line jumper for Spazajevic goes. That's his first two. And it's the first double-digit lead for UMBC in this series. Lamont doesn't trail by double digits very often. Shungu for three. That was a line drive brick. He has really not been himself tonight. Well, John Becker was right. They're not going to shoot tonight like they did last night. Nope. But you, wouldn't have ex you would not have expected the drop-off to be this great. And it's a credit to UMBC's defense. Horvath looking for an opening. Good D there by Shungu. Who else? Bunyasith, little pop. Shungu may not make shots, but he'll always play defense. You mentioned he was a defensive player of the year in the league last, last season. Had eight rebounds yesterday and four assists. 
He is an all-around player, Ben Shungu, local product from South Burlington. Well, and, and John Becker said the reason he's become so good is his work ethic. He was not a good shooter when he got to Vermont. And he was saying that during pan the pandemic this summer, when the players couldn't get into Patrick Jim to work out at all, he would be walking around his neighborhood or and he'd run into neighbors and say, oh, I just saw Ben running. I just saw Ben working out in the park. I just saw Ben doing this nonstop. You know John, in life, as you know, it's what you do when no one's watching. Well said. A miss by Powell, rebound Kennedy. And another thing that's been a factor here is that UMBC, uh, Vermont's been one and done. UMBC has done, Ryan Odom said they had to rebound and they have rebounded. Spasiljevic with Davis. Now the double from Shungu. Inside for Aachen, picked off by Powell. Good idea, not good execution. Or Shungu. Maybe bad idea. <laughs> Look at this defense by UNBC, and it's out of bounds off Shungu. And that was Bunyasith, who's not known for his defense, standing in there and forcing Shungu to lose the ball off, off uh, his hands without really getting the shot off. Here you go. Here's Bunyasith. And he does get the shot off, and I'm not sure who that went off. Mm. But the Retrievers getting the benefit of everything right now. Less than a minute to play in the half. <laughs> Quick double from Powell on Aachen. Now they back off. Aachen taking Powell to the basket. Kept alive by Spazoyevic. Kennedy will pop and score. And that's a huge three for UMBC because not only does it make the lead 14, but even though Vermont should get the last shot, UMBC gets the first possession second half. And that's 12 for Kennedy off the bench. What a first half from the transfer from Lebec Community College in Kansas. And the run for UMBC right now, by the way, is 29 to... That's a travel. 29 to 8, and now they will get the last shot. Another turnover. This this uh, spate of turnovers by Vermont is not like them at all. Well, they had 10 last night. They've got 10 tonight. Like I said. Plenty of time here for UNBC to move it down court. Yeah, I would, I would reverse it. I would have had Rodgers taking the inbounds pass, but Kennedy gets off a shot. Little shot. Short at the buzzer, and the Retrievers will have to settle for a 14-point lead. That man, Keandre Kennedy, number zero for UMBC. Anything but 12 points, five of seven from the field, two of four from downtown, and he has lifted UMBC, John. Uh, not only him, but he has lifted the Retrievers. To yeah, that no, big and lead. he was five of six until that last miss at the buzzer. But as I said, the defense has been critical 20 points Vermont held to they average more than 70 a game and they had 80 last night so tremendous job on the defensive end for UMBC to that note just three of their last 19 for Vermont from the field in this game halftime here at the event center UMBC by 14 over Vermont back after this on ESPN 3 Back at you here at the event center. John, definition of a difference maker, Keandre Kennedy. Yeah, Keandre Kennedy did it at both ends of the floor. There you see him creating one of the 10 Vermont turnovers at the defensive end and then making shot after shot at the offensive end. He was five out of six from the field until taking a three as the buzzer was going off. Nice pass there from Dan Aachen to set him up and another nice pass from Dan Aachen to set him up for a three. But he was that offensive spark that was needed for UMBC. Ryan Davis was basically in the offense for Vermont. They scored 20 points. He had 11 of the 20 points in the first half, shooting four out of seven from the field. And he only, quote unquote, played 15 minutes because John Becker opted to give him a rest. But look at Vermont's numbers. If you take out the four out of seven for Davis, the rest of the team is four out of 17. They were 16 of 24 the second half last night. Credit to UMBC's defense. And again, that turnover number is huge, 10 to three, as are the bench points. Keandre Kennedy comes off the bench. 18 for UMBC, none for Vermont. Vermont only had six points off the bench last night. They depend on their starting five. UMBC right now, or I should say UMBC was trailing 
You t talk about the definition of a difference maker. When Kennedy came in at 16.09 of the first half, the Retrievers were tailing, trailing 10-5. Right. Since then, it's 29-10 UMBC. And that, that's unheard of for a Vermont team. And again, credit to UMBC for what they've done, especially on the defensive end, but also uh, very out of, uncharacteristic for Vermont to struggle on offense the way they have. Having said all of that, there is plenty of time left in this one. And of course, this is Vermont we're talking about. It is Vermont we're talking about. And we saw an America East semifinal here a couple of years ago. I thought that was a walk, personally. But Spasievich gets the foul call. That's a, qu that's a quick third foul on Davis, And John. that's very critical. And here you see, he walked. I mean, he, he got fouled, but he'd already taken three steps. So a break there. Mike Kitt's giving a break there to UMBC, putting Spazajevic on the line and getting Ryan Davis his third foul. But we saw an eight America East semifinal, and Davis has to come out, and that's big for Vermont. Here two years ago, where Hartford trailed by 26 with 15 minutes left and had the lead in the last minute before losing in overtime. Still one of the most extraordinary games I've ever seen. In fact, double overtime. Double overtime, that's right. Spasajevic, 0 for 2. Well, that was a little bit of justice there because he shouldn't have been on the line. Steph Smith for Vermont had the big game last night, 6 for 7 for downtown. Only 1 for 3 in the first half. And he shot 1 for 5, and Shungu shot 1 for 5 from, from the field. That's a huge difference from last night. And they both made everything they looked at. Murphy so, gets doubled. Tough shot there. Murphy had come in for Davis. One and done. Owens pulls it down. And again, Vermont had one offensive rebound in the first half. One. Good pass. The defense and by Shungu. Good out of recovery bounds. defense by Shungu. That's why he was the defensive player of the year in the America East a year ago. It's a good pass, but good recovery by Shungu. Where well, Vermont's really dominated the postseason awards in general. Becker's working on four straight Coach of the Year awards, and they've had four straight Player of the Year awards. Anthony Lamb won two, graduated last year, but when you finish first every year, you tend to dominate the awards. Sure do. Owens at the buzzer, won't go. Missoula high for Vermont. Missoula, the transfer from GW, can't a little, finish. A little out of control there. Didn't look for his teammates at all. Rogers. Fast paced. Nothing happening, though, on the scoreboard. Well, the clock's moving. <laughs> that's true. And the shot percentages are going down. That's also true. And that's a foul. LJ Owens will pick up the foul. That'll be number three. On the junior guard from Annapolis, Maryland. Well, the good thing for Ryan Odom is when L.J. Owens picks up his third foul, he looks over at Keandre Kennedy. What an asset that is. Well, that's depth. And UMBC has depth when they can play both Akin and Spazievich in the post and when Kennedy can come in for Owens. Nice pass. Smith gets free and lays it in. Well, Smith posted. Rogers there. Rogers tried to get around him to keep the pass from entering and couldn't do it, so it was an easy layup. Smith now with five. Vermont had a couple big droughts, scoring droughts, I'm saying, in the first half. One that was almost six minutes long, but they get the first two here in the second half. Took us two minutes, though. Kennedy trying to create. A rebound comes down to Shungu. In eight last night. Shungu all the way. Scores! Again, you got to stop the basketball, especially when a guy like Shungu has it. And Ryan Odom takes a quick timeout to remind his players that, as you said, this game ain't over. Not even close. A mini 4-0 run here for Vermont. We'll take a timeout to 17-32 left in this one. The lead was 14 at the half. It's down to 10. Today's game between Vermont and UMBC is the final regular season game for these two teams, but some big America East contests, John, over the weekend. No doubt about it, and the biggest one that you see right there at the top, New Hampshire and UMass Lowell. If New Hampshire wins that game, they will finish third 
meaning they get a bye in the quarter in the first round of the tournament. And Hartford, which is not playing this weekend, because they will finish a half game behind New Hampshire if UNH wins that game, will have to play two games to get to the semis instead of playing one game to get to the semis. So that is the biggest game, but a lot at stake for NJIT and Albany and Stony Brook, all in the middle of the rankings. Binghamton's gonna be the ninth seed no matter what, but that New Hampshire-UMass Lowell game is, is an example of what COVID has done to this season because coaches always say, hey, if you win your games, you, you don't have to complain about anything. But if you don't get to play a game, you can't win a game. And that's the position Hartford's in. They're gonna have to sit and watch helplessly tomorrow and hope that Lowell can win that game playing at home. Good ball movement here for UMBC. Rogers misses on a three ball. Up ahead now for Mott. Looks like they got a little pep in their step. Scored the last four on two straight possessions. Well, nothing wrong with that shot out of the timeout for Rogers, as we know. It just didn't go in. John Becker takes Ryan Davis out with three fouls. Murphy now in the game. Double He's teamed. got it. And a foul called on the Retrievers. Looks like it'll be on Kennedy. Again, I don't know that I, I, I'm calling that foul if I'm John Floyd. There was contact for sure, but he was able to pass out of that double team. See? Again, there's contact, but it didn't affect his ability to make the pass. First on Kennedy, second on the team. Ball in here for UMBC. Here's Smith, a two-pointer. Nice rebound by Horvath with a big wing. And Smith going to his left, right-handed shooter. Always a tougher shot. I thought he walked. There it is. Travel. First traveling call I've gotten right tonight. Fourth turnover. Did we say on tonight UMBC? or this evening when it's, it's a, five o'clock? That's a good question. I, it always makes me crazy when we watch a one o'clock football game or basketball game and the announcers say tonight. So it's five o'clock. Well, but it's six now. Well, it is six. So it, do we say this evening? Six is evening, this isn't evening it? This evening is a little, it's a little, feel like, you know, chunky to say. Like tonight, you know? Tonight, I guess. The sun's not quite down yet, though. Well, it's a good it will be by the end of the game. Ooh, Neither is the shot brick. from Shungu. And it'll be ball in UNBC. That was a 19-footer that went 21 feet. Ben Shungu having a real, Shungu and, and Smith both struggling with their shot tonight. Both missed nothing last night. Four for 13 combined here in the game, but the Retrievers still haven't scored with almost four minutes gone in the half. Mike Krzyzewski would say that's the basketball gods evening things up. <laughs> Borbath. Nice move there, just didn't go in again. Borbath now one for five in the game. There's Powell. Air ball from 10 feet. Oh, ball. look at this action. Good hustle there by both teams. Looks like it'll stay with Vermont on the jump ball. And we'll step aside on the 15-51 uh, mark of the second half. Again, plenty of time left in this one. Two powerhouse teams. Retrievers by 10. 15.51 left in this one. The Retrievers by 10. Let's reset that last scrumble. I don't even know if that's a word, but it is now. I like it. Of what happened. Here you see Horvath playing very good defense there, forcing an air ball. And then here comes this crazy scramble for the ball. Horvath can't grab it. Murphy's on the floor. Naturally, Rogers is on the floor. Everybody's trying to call timeout, even though no one has possession. And you end up with a jump ball. and. UMBC, uh, excuse me, Vermont retains possession with 16 seconds on the shot clock. That's one rules change I've always liked, when that you, the shot clock doesn't go back to 30. Right, stays the way where it, it is. used to. I still don't like the reset to 20 after a, an offensive rebound, though. So I, what does John Becker tell his team now, trailing by 10? Keep doing what you're doing. You know, keep looking for good shots. Uh, and keep guarding the way you have. They haven't given up a point in four minutes and nine seconds, so... He's got to be pleased with his defense. And Ryan Odom's got to be telling his squad, hey, let's not uh, take the foot off the gas here. Yeah, I think that's what he said at the first time out. I think at this one, he probably went back to basics and he's trying to figure out a way to get a good shot on the next possession, regardless of what happens here. Again, Ryan Davis out of the lineup for Vermont with three fouls. Well, that's offensive. That has to oh, no. they call a block. You know what? I think John Floyd on the outside had the charge. 
Earl Walton under the basket, maybe not with as good an angle, had a block. Let's let's see this. This is sort of like the call that was called offensive in the first half. Yeah, there was a little bit of movement there. And the other thing is, Aachen put his shoulder out. So yeah, and, maybe not a bad call. And the third thing is, upon review, Steph Smith actually didn't barrel into No, maybe. he was driving the basketball. Someday you, you or someone smarter than me will explain to me how you dribble without driving. Because I hear all these big-time announcers Dri talk about the drive. dribble drive. Mm -hmm. John Calipari's dribble drive offense. Somebody explain to me how you can drive without dribbling. I'd like to know. Steph Smith, the senior guard from Ajax, Ontario, hits both. It's an eight-point game. Vermont has outscored UMBC 6-0 in the second half. Hawken. Murphy for Vermont. A little bit of a quick shot there for UMBC. Hawkins gotten better and better working inside, but he's still not your number one offensive guy. Should be Horvath. Powell slicing, dicing, scoring. Powell passed up the three there, saw the opening, went to the basket. Now it starts to get serious. The UMBC needs to get going because the lead's down to six. It's an 8-0 run for the Cats. Rogers. Again, a quick shot. But good hustle by Horvath to get the rebound. And draw the foul. Second foul on That'll be on Vermont. Murphy. That's a big offensive rebound for Horvath. He took it away, basically. Yeah. Last two possessions, UMBC's kind of quick shot the ball. Need to set, set a ball screen, get somebody open. Shot clock to 20 now for the Retrievers. Again. They've been held scoreless here, first five minutes of the second half. That, Idle Rock. That Hawkins. was a good offensive possession. Idle Rock gets in the lane, gets the help to come to him, and perfect pass to Aachen, who can outjump anybody on this court. The senior from London, England, Murphy for three. That wasn't the shot Vermont wanted, I guarantee you that. A little momentum change here. If Idle Rock can convert, he got fouled. fouled. Shungu will pick it up. That'll be team foul number three. And if, you, if UMBC goes on and wins this game, you might look back on that offensive rebound by Horvath as one of the big plays. And here you see Idle Rock's gotten so good in transition. No question he got fouled. I'm not sure it was a shooting foul, but I, I prefer when they get called that way, more the NBA rule, because I hate the college rule where a guy goes up and because he wasn't quite in his shooting motion, they call it on the floor. What an interesting combination of point guard basically you have for UMBC. You got the big body of Idle Rock and the little pickpocket of Rogers. Yeah. And, and Idle Rock has the body of a power forward. He really does. And he hits both free throws here to back the lead up to 10. Walk. Oh, he stepped on the baseline. I thought he walked, actually. Same same result. Turnover on Murphy, number 11 for the team. Davis now will check in, and Murphy will sit down for John Becker. And again, think for a moment. The lead was down to six. Rodgers takes a quick shot. If Vermont gets a rebound, they're coming down to cut it to four or three. Instead, Horvath gets the rebound, and now it's 10. That should be a jump ball. Right, calling out of bounds off Rogers. There they are. I thought I thought he got tied up as he went up. Defense put together by Aaron Deloney on that one, who was just checked in, the sophomore from Portland, Oregon. And he's a player that John Becker thinks is going to get a lot more minutes in the, in the near future. Of course, both these teams have seniors who might very well be playing again next year. I, I've asked both coaches if they think their seniors are going to come back, guys like Spazievich and Aachen uh, on, and, and Rogers for UMBC and guys like uh, Smith and Shungo for Vermont. They might all be back next year. There's a leaner for Bailey Patella it's off the bench. a big basket for Vermont. Patella now with his first two in the game. 
What I'm referencing is the fact that the NCAA has given everybody another year of eligibility because of COVID. Hawking going inside, foul picked up by Patella on the backside of the defense. That'll send Hawking to the line. Hawking seems to do better at the line shooting two than one and one. He, he, he gets tighter when it's one and one. Although he missed two early in the first half, so. You'll notice this thing, he doesn't uh, dribble the ball. No, he hasn't done that for two years now. And he makes the first. He's better this year. He was at 50% coming into the series. Last year, I think he was, what, 38%? It, it was not good. <laughs> yeah, that's generally not good. It's a both. two for two there. Lead back up to 10. Line squirrels and acorns on that one for me. <laughs> Here's Deloney running point now for Vermont. Murphy. Murphy hasn't been close. Oh, and Danny that's foul. gonna be on Murphy, or, or I should say on uh, Davis. Yeah, that was Davis who missed. Yeah. We, we both missed that one. <laughs> but Davis has been close, obviously, he hit his first three. But that's a fourth foul on Davis. Gotta take him out. And, 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 and really a bad foul. You know, he misses the shot and he's frustrated and he comes in with the left arm out. Yeah, for what? For what? He's 80 feet from the basket. What's he trying to accomplish? That's a frustration foul. When you're a senior, you can't afford to, he's a junior actually, you can't afford to commit that foul regardless. Bunya Sith back in the game for UNBC. Again, big development here. Ryan Davis now with four fouls on the bench for Vermont. And he was their offense in the first half. Here's Patella with Horvath, he'll take him, and score! Patella can't guard Horvath inside. And Horvath recognized that. Use the left hand, gets to the basket. Only four for Horvath, but he's got seven rebounds. And much more active inside the lane. Deloney. He fouled him, Horvath fouled him before the shot. <laughs> That's his first personal tonight, fourth on the team. Vermont's committed six. Retrievers were in the bonus for about seven minutes of that first half. Yeah, again, that's not Vermont-like to commit the, the fouls that they committed. Here's Smith with a strong move. And that's going to be, that's what I'm talking about there where it's called before the shot. And, and Earl Walton called it right, don't get me wrong. I just don't like the rule. I think that should be two shots. Third personal on Kennedy, fourth on the team. And again, shot clock at 20 as John Becker looks on. And retrievers will go here. They'll substitute. L.J. Owens will come in. And Kennedy will sit down with those three fouls. They both have three fouls now, Owens and Kennedy. So Ryan Odom will rotate them for the remaining 12.30. They don't play at the, on the, at the same time very often anyway. And again, the big guy, nice, nice slice here by Smith. The big guy for Vermont, Davis with four fouls on the bench. It's Smith, a 10 point game. Smith credit recognizing that his shot isn't there at the moment, going to the basket a couple times. Here's Aachen with Fiorillo, who's checked back in. Horvath downtown. It was a good play by Aachen. He recognized the double, found an open shooter. Horvath couldn't finish. Deloney with a strong drive and down that's the right a shooting side. Foul. That one will be on Bunyasith. Fifth on the team, first on Bunyasith, and a timeout on the floor. Hold on to your seats. This one is far from over. Vermont trails by 10, but they're on the march. Back after this. Back at you here from the event center with the Retrievers on top by 10. Ryan Davis has been the big guy for Vermont all year long, John, but he's been saddled with foul trouble tonight. Yeah, picked up a quick foul in the first minute, first possession of the second half, which I thought was a bad call. I thought uh, Spazujevic walked on that call, and that turned out to be critical because he came back in and almost right away picked up his fourth, which was a, a bad foul he committed reaching on a, on a, on a rebound. Um, he had 11 points in the first half, has not scored in this half, has only taken one shot. And you know how coaches always used to say, I'm not comfortable when this guy is sitting on the bench next to me. This year the saying is, I'm not comfortable when this guy's wearing his mask. <laughs> and right now, Ryan Davis is wearing his mask. 
At the same time, Vermont has trimmed a 14-point deficit to 10. Yep, and Aaron Deloney will be at the line. They had it to six at one point. Started the half on an 8-0 run. Deloney, the sophomore from Portland, six feet, 165. It's the first free throw. Saw some playing time last year, but with Missoula coming around this year, kind of disrupting the backcourt a little bit, he's seen uh, less playing time. And John Becker expects him to see a good deal more playing time next season. It's both here, big free throws. The lead for UMBC now down to eight. Try to rock with a step back. And the swish. That's what I meant earlier about Idle Rock. He has become a guy who, if you get, if he's squared up, he is a very good shooter. That was not the case his first two years. Idle Rock's first bucket tonight. He's six for six from the line. Eight points. Deloney is short, and Idle Rock pulls it down. Not that short. He's about six feet tall. <laughs> Shot was short. I think that's what you meant. That's exactly what I meant. <laughs> Thanks for pointing it out, John. I'm here for you. You always have. You know we've been doing this five years now? It's hard to believe. Can you believe it? We, it's like we have a relationship. Three-pointer by Idle Rock. That's five straight for RJ. Well, and that, again, he'd been quiet most of the night. Only had six points until those last two possessions. And again, his ability to shoot the basketball. You cannot give him space. Deloney tries to answer. He's, Idle Rock. He's still short. Again. Now, now I've got you saying it. <laughs> this will be a foul on Shungu. I'm trying to get through that screen there. And that is 16 fouls. So Deloney and, yes, it is. Deloney and Fiorillo sit down now. Patella and Both Murphy teams will here. shoot the rest of the game. Both teams with 16 fouls. And we all know how critical one and ones have been for UMBC in the past. Idle Rock. Yeah, feeling it a little bit there, but didn't get his legs into that shot. Aachen cuts off Shungu on the baseline. Shungu will try again. Aachen is quick enough to stay with Shungu. Tend to shoot Shungu. Three straight, came out way three straight shots by Vermont, short, considerably short, and you wonder if their legs are a little bit weary. Well, but I tell you, on that one, though, I think Shungu was surprised that Aachen came out on him. Yeah, very possible. And Aachen strong here, and he'll go to the line. Three straight shots short and then giving up an offensive rebound, though. You got, you got to wonder a little. This is, this is the perfect play because, again, Idle Rock knows that I can allow jump anybody on the floor to get the basketball, and there's the foul. After making two in a row, it's almost inevitable he missed the next one. Here comes Steph Smith back in for Vermont. Patella sits down. Aachen one for two. We talked about the need for UMBC to reestablish themselves, John, in the paint tonight. I think the combination of Aachen, Horvath, Spazojevic, even Idle Rock at certain times, they have. Yeah, and again, the, the fact that they've given up so few offensive rebounds. They, they, they made it harder for Vermont to get to the basket on their, their initial offense, but beyond that, they've not given up any offensive boards. There's Again, Thomas Murphy double trying team, to turn. And he walked. Yep, turnover. And that's just what we were talking about. Last night, he would have gotten that shot off and probably made it. Let's not minimize the foul trouble for Ryan Davis tonight, too. That's put a big complexion on this game. No doubt. But they were getting the ball inside. To, it felt like everybody last night. Again, these back-to-backs. It's really hard, I think, for the team that wins the first night to come, come out with the same edge the second night. Although, in this case, I thought would be different because you're playing for a conference title. Shungu. Foul called on Rodgers. The lead is back up to 14 as it was at the half. And exactly. That's what Ryan Odom can feel good about right now. That his team came out cold to start the second half. 
Vermont's had a run, and now we're almost 11 minutes into the half, and the lead is the same as it was at halftime. And you go back to that offensive rebound by Horvath, which stepped the tie. I really think that was a turning point. Here's Shungu, former walk-on. He goes from walk-on to defensive player of the year. And perhaps a first-team all-conference player this year, maybe first or second team for sure. Quite a story. Kid from Burlington, all, grew up a Vermont fan. 20 last night, had a great high school career. It wasn't like he was no, he, some, some schlepper, you right. know. But, but he didn't quite have the quickness or the shooting ability to be a D1 player, at least according to John, John Becker, who knew his game better than anybody. He was a three-time state champ in high school. There's Bunyasith now with 10 to shoot. Horvath and Missoula. Not as effective when he goes away from the basket as he's shooting the ball. Smith trying to work some magic. Shungu. Just hasn't been able to buy one. Not happening tonight. Shungu two for nine. Bunyasith. Thought he'd make that. He's yeah. usually a good open shooter. He's not shy. No, not shy at all. Pal, straight away. Ooh, short again. Four for 19 from downtown for Vermont. And another jumper, open jumper, well short. This is sports, John. Last night they were 10 for 21. Bunyasith. And if you tick out Wilson, who was one for six, they were nine of 15. All the way, Missoula, big bucket. And they needed that one. The transfer from GW with four. But he was a starter. He was big time at GW for a while. Oh, no, he was a starter and a very good player. He and Bunyasith played against each other because Bunyasith was, was at American for two years. Four back from three. Hasn't been able to buy one from outside, and we know he can shoot from there. Sixth rebound from Missoula. Smith inside, pivot foot. They'll slow it down. It's only a 10-point game. Now inside, and a foul called, I believe, on Bunyasith. Ryan Odom is intense over there on the benches. I think we've seen him all year. And a timeout on the floor. It is on Bunyasith with 7-12 left to go. 10-point lead for the Retrievers, but don't count out the Cats. So the big three from last night for Vermont, Davis, Shungu, Smith, how are they doing tonight? Well, not nearly as well. Uh, last night they scored 61 points combined and shot 22 out of 36 from the field, both twos and threes. Tonight, you can see they're combined nine out of nine out of 25, which is 36 percent. Even my math can figure that out. So that's been, again, as Dean Smith always like like to say, the other team gives scholarships too. And tonight, the guys with scholarships from UMBC have done a much better job on defense, making making them shoot contested shots most of the time. So we speculated that at the next time out. John Becker would bring Ryan Davis back in. It's the next time out, and Ryan Davis still on the bench. Yeah, I'm a little bit surprised. 7-12 left, down 10. But he obviously, and Murphy misses. Murphy's done nothing tonight. Made five threes at Stony Brook last weekend in one, one of the two games. But I, John Becker's won a few more games than I have, so I'm not really one to question him, but I would think I would have Davis back in, and now he's going to come back in. Comes in at the 6.57 mark as Murphy will sit down after the missed free throw. Maybe he knew Murphy was going to miss the free throw, <laughs> and he wasn't going to be able to get in anyway. Right. <laughs> and the Retrievers turn it over on a bad pass inside. Miscommunication between Kennedy and Spazajevic. That is the sixth turnover for UMBC tonight, 12 for Vermont. There's Powell, cut off again by Aachen on the baseline. They've done such a good job double teaming those guys when they drive the basketball. There have been very few one-on-one -on -one trips to the lane that way. Missoula and Owens gets called. That'll be number four on LJ Owens. 
And they'll be one and one. Ninth foul on UMBC. And there's a lot of time left in this game. Yeah, they can't afford, Vermont can't afford to miss any more free throws, so they missed that one and one coming out of the timeout by Murphy. Well, they were perfect last night, 12 for 12. Ooh. This one rolls through. Mazzilla thought that one was not going in. Shooter usually knows. Shooter usually, especially good shooter, and he's a good shooter. But he got the front rim, rim roll, if I can say that. Yeah, try to say it three times. Front rim roll, front rim roll, front rim roll. Yes! <laughs> Fourth time, I don't think I'd have made it. Two for two for Missoula. Patella checks back in for Vermont. Missoula sits down. And again, we're back down to an eight-point game. Yeah, and Ryan Odom got uh, Brandon Horvath back in the game quickly there. Tried to get him a little breather coming out of the TV timeout. Played 40 minutes last night. Rogers at the point for UMBC. Rogers, Kennedy, and Idle Rock the backcourt. Overplay by Patella. Let's see what Idle Rock does. Less than 10 to shoot. There's Spazajevic now with Davis. Spazajevic did a good job turning away from the double team, but couldn't finish. That's been a problem for him really ever since he got here. Is he he's had, makes nice moves but has trouble finishing at times. Davis did a good job of just standing his ground. Yeah, did not foul exactly. Good look on side. Davis oh can't goodness. finish. Boy, you sure didn't expect that. Wow. Davis. Stay with Vermont. Probably should have gone up and dunked the ball actually. Retrievers will make a substitution here. They'll bring Hocken in for Spazojevic. See, I think they might want to go to Aachen because he's a little bit better offensively in the post and try to work on Davis a bit to get that fifth foul or at least score because Davis can't really guard you. Patella will inbound here for Vermont. Again, winner of this game gets home court in the tournament. Well, the loser will get home court in the semis. That is true. These are the one and two teams. Right. No, no uh, question about that. The winner, if it wins its semi, will get home court in the final. And that's obviously, if you're Ryan Odom, you'd rather play that game here than in Vermont. If you're John Becker, you'd rather play the game with Patrick Jim. And there's Idle Rock again with penetration. Take a look. Oh, he had Patella looking the other way. And that was and the, the other came end. from Shungu. Yeah. We talk about the offensive rebound by Horvath. That missed layup by Davis could be very critical going down the stretch here. Lead could have been six. Instead, it could go back to 10. Surprising last night, the Retrievers did not shoot well from the line, 11 of 18, but their best free throw shooter, Idle Rock, missed three. And what's interesting about it was he shot very well from the field. Back to 10 now with 5.20 left to go. Three-fifths of the UMBC coaching staff on their feet now. That's a 60% clip, John. It is. Davis, little floater. He's probably thinking, now I make it. Davis with 13. First bucket of the second half. Yeah, good point. Idle Rock all the way. He is really tough to guard when he goes to the basket if help doesn't come. And took advantage of Davis, who couldn't foul. Exactly right. Patella. The bench has just done nothing. Over the back on Powell. The bench has done nothing for Vermont. And John Becker has needed the bench to do something because the starters have struggled offensively. It'll be one and one for Horvath. Idle Rock now quietly, second half, 11 points. Yeah. He was quiet in the first half, but then he had that little run where he made the, the driving bank shot and then hit the three on the next possession. Horvath the line had seven uh, points last night. Feast or famine, he either swishes two or front rims the first. Got nine rebounds today. Leads the conference huh. in rebounds. Well, I was close. Yeah, rattled out. Rattled out. I would have expected it to be missing front rim it. 
Lead's been hovering between 10 and 8 for like the last four minutes. Smith stolen. Picked up though by Powell. Good work by Rogers. Pickpocket point guard. Short again. And there's definitely a pattern here, Gary. They have yep. been short on almost all their jump shots the last five or six minutes. And I think that has to do with being a little bit tired. Jump shooters back-to-back -back games may not be a good mix. He was six for seven from downtown. Very good point. Last night. There's Idle Rock. Penetration has it stolen away. Good defense there by Vermont. Double team the ball. Smith will drive. Triple team there. Forced it. Again, the interior defense of UMBC has been the key to this basketball game. And the and the Vermont Catamounts have tested it, John. It's not like they're because shying that's the away. Way they play. That's right. That's how they play inside out. Three twenty left in a ten point game. UMBC using a little bit of clock here now. Ocken, the cutter, the score! And again, Davis could do nothing but stand there and watch because he didn't want to foul out. That third foul, which I didn't think was a foul, was a critical point in this basketball game. Although UMBC's been the better team. Davis, double. They'll call Idle Rock on the help defense. Aachen, by the way, now with 11 points in the game. And that's a huge boost offensively for UMBC. And a timeout on the floor. 2.57 left in the final regular season game for these two teams. The winner, home court in the tournament. Well, a tale of two basketball games here last night and tonight here in Baltimore. UMBC losing to Vermont by nine last night, 80-71, leading by 12. What's been the difference, John? Well, you see a lot of it right there. Uh, 25 points off the bench. Four, Vermont's had a total of 10 points off the bench in two nights, but the first night their starters didn't miss a shot. The 12 turnovers, Vermont's done better in the second half. They had 10 in the first half. Neither team shooting the ball particularly well, but I go back to the interior defense that UMBC has played throughout the game. They've given up very little inside. They've, they've double teamed anybody who drives the basketball. And unlike last night where Vermont all was often able to pitch it back outside for an open three that would go in. When they pitched it back outside for an open three, they haven't gone in. And that, that's that been a huge difference in the game. And, you know, John Becker almost called it when I talked to him this morning. He said, we're not going to shoot tonight the way we did last night. They shot 16 for 24 from the field in the second half uh, as a team and uh, were four out of six from from three in the second half. They've been nowhere close to that tonight. And some of that's fatigue, but a lot of that is the defense. Ryan Davis at the line for Vermont, the only player in a Catamount uniform with double digits in the game. He hits uh, the free throw now for 14 points. Both but again, team. Davis with foul trouble has been a huge storyline. Yeah, no question. And again, I go back to that third foul, and I'm sure John Becker will when he looks at the tape because that was a critical call. So offense, defense, they bring in Patella. Do they pressure the basketball now? They're trailing gonna, by 10. They're going to try, put it that way. And that's why Darnell Rogers becomes the key player on the court right now. Well, you got some good free throw shooters in there. Kennedy, one of the best in the country, at See, over 93%. I don't think John Becker wanted to foul either him or foul that early, mm. especially when they had the ball trapped. And John Becker wants to talk about it. Did John Becker call timeout? The, the PA guy just said timeout. UMBC called the timeout. So this is a UMBC timeout now with 2.54 left. The Taylor Krimmel, who we left. don't give enough credit to, telling me that from the truck. Our director. You're our director, right, Taylor? <laughs> I don't know, I, as Bob Woodward said during Watergate, I don't know titles. <laughs> I just report. Retrievers now with no timeouts left. Vermont has three. Boy, what a job Ryan Odom, you see him there. Both, both of these coaches have done just tremendous jobs with their programs. Well, I mean, as I said earlier, this is, this is a coach's league from top to bottom. I mean, 
Richard Barron, the coach at Maine, whose team has been shut down, is a really good basketball Look coach. at this break here. And that's just what Ryan Odom wanted. Started by the pickpocket. Missoula the other way. So I guess that wasn't a foul, right? But that was yeah. a timeout. That was a timeout. Ke Keandre Kennedy was trapped and called timeout very smartly. And then they did get the ball where it needed to go to, to Rodgers. Patella with the reverse for Vermont. Gets it back down to 10. Retrievers do a good job over the timeline. You know, we often talk about players' journeys, John, uh, how they got here. What about coaches? John Becker spent two years at Gallaudet yeah. coaching. That's where he started That's where he his started. coaching career. Started. And Aachen gets fouled here by Patella. And eventually went to Catholic under Mike Lonergan. Correct. Followed him north to Vermont, Vermont when he got the Vermont job and then succeeded him. And has done nothing but build on the success that both Tom Brennan and and uh, Mike Lonergan had up there. Yep. Tom Brennan started it. Mike Lonergan continued it. John Becker's perfected it. I still remember after Vermont beat Syracuse in the NCAA tournament in 2005. Overtime oh, game by I three. Was, I was at that game and <laughs> Tom Brennan's first comment in the in the in the post game interview was, "I'll never have to buy a drink in Vermont in Burlington for the rest of my life." And he was right. He, I don't think he buys a drink anywhere. <laughs> Aachen at the free throw line here. One out of two, which is. But there's Horvath again. Another critical offensive rebound. Well, that that may have been a big one right there. He well, hasn't shot the ball well tonight, but he's made some key plays on the boards and uh, played good defense. He's got double-digit rebounds. Idle Rock stolen away. Missoula. That was not a good pass or a needed pass. Nine-point lead. Still time. Especially the way Vermont plays defense. Well, UMBC should be able to handle this pressure because they've got good ball handlers on the floor in Rogers, Idle Rock, and Kennedy. And actually, Horvath's not bad either for a big guy. But they're going to have to make free throws. That's why Aachen just came out of the game. Right. Owens in for Aachen. Yep. Another, another good ball handler who can make free throws. That's all they need now. They need ball handling and free throws. John Becker wants pressure. And he's setting up his defense. He's gonna let he's gonna let Horvath. Okay, so that's and I think it's a smart move. He's gonna let Hor Horvath have the pass. That's right. They're not guarding. They're trying to do something to, on the inbounds, and they almost did. Oh, how did he get out of that? Well, went under everybody. Got got dinged a little bit there. And this will be a bonus now for UMBC, putting a great free throw shooter at the line. Let's take a look here. Just they almost get the steal on the inbounds there. Still inbounds, yeah. And, and he's trapped, and he throws it, tried to throw it off a defender there. He did. And, and then Missoula fouled him as he went by. It's a pretty nifty move for the little Rogers. He is pretty nifty. 5'2", 150. It's a big guy in a little guy's body. He's 150 wearing, you know, 10 pound weights, but he's all muscle. Dad, Shante, as you uh, alluded to earlier, one of the greats in GW history. Towered over his son at 5'4. <laughs> <laughs> Player of the year in the uh, Atlantic 10 back in 99. Great career in Baltimore high school basketball. Played overseas. Family went with time. him. Yeah, I, I, Darnell speaks French. Yeah, speaks a couple languages, yeah. actually. He spent time in France, Belgium. I'm reminded when I hear people speaking an extra language of the late, great John Thompson, who the coaches this week have been wearing the, the towels towel, again right. in his honor. And he was giving a speech one night, and he threw in a few of his favorite words in the speech. <laughs> and it was a very dressed-up crowd. This is when he got the Dean Smith Award down in Chapel Hill the first one. And you could kind of hear the crowd kind of go <gasps> a couple times and finally turns and he looks at me and goes, John, these people don't understand that I'm bilingual. I speak English and I speak profanity. <laughs> and it very accurate comment by John. Yeah, the late great John Thompson turned that program around. 
when he Speaking was. Speaking of that. When he was first hired, the president of the school said to him, just make the NIT every few years, we'll be happy. <laughs> they did make the NIT three times, but 21 other times they made the NCAAs. I was going to say, I think John Thompson over-delivered. Quite a bit. All right, Shungu back to the game. Shungu with two free throws, but here a foul on Vermont. We'll send UMBC back to the line for two. And again, this, as I said before, this comes down to ball handling and free, free throw shooting. That's a shooter's roll. Didn't get the roll. Hawking back in the game for defense now. That crawled up the rim. I'll tell you, you know, what, 81% of the world is right-handed? Maybe more, I don't even know. I thought it was more. I yeah. thought it was over 90. Something about a lefty shot, you know? Well, speaking as a lefty. <laughs> in more ways than one. In every possible way. Mazula. Nice pass there, and he couldn't oh. finish. Retrievers need to stop fouling. Right. And they need to keep the clock moving. And when you foul, you stop the clock. You give them a chance to make two points with the clock stopped. Take a look here at the pass from Patella. It looked like he got fouled. And he sees Missoula making that curl cut. And Missoula just doesn't quite finish. Three would have been a lot better than two for I was going to say, that's a, right yeah, that's a big point. Yeah, that's a big point. Owens back in the game for UMBC. By the way, I have a, a uh, plaque on my desk that my mother gave me years ago. It says, God made a few per perfect people, and then he made the rest right-handed. <laughs> and I don't have any other lefty in my family. Really? Extended family. The only other lefty in my family is one of my cats. He's left pawed. How do you know that? Because he reaches with his left paw. <laughs> For food, usually off my plate. You and your cat share the same plate? Frequently. <laughs> Much to the horror of my wife. And again, Rogers is the go-to guy here. Yeah. For obvious reasons. Get him the ball. He's not likely to turn it over, and he's likely to make his free throws. Retrievers are 18 for 26 pending this free throw. What a difference from night, from last night to tonight. 19 out of 27 isn't spectacular, but it's better than 11 out of 18, that's for sure. 70 plus percent. Yeah, we'll take and, it. and Vermont's missed some tonight, whereas last night they didn't miss any. Lead back up to 11 with 105 to go. I think they got to shoot a three here myself. And Missoula continues inside. And Missoula has now scored, what, the last six in a row? John Becker not taking a timeout because the clock stops now that it's under a minute. UMBC goes right back to Rodgers, which is <laughs> the right thing to do. Again, Idle hey. Rock, who's a good free throw shooter. Get it out of Aachen. Oh, they fouled Aachen. I'm not sure why Aachen was on the floor there. So Aachen will go to the line. Again, it's for two, yeah, not no, one that, and one. That helps Aachen. It always seems to help him mentally to shoot two. You know, when Rodgers is in the game, especially in this type of situation, like, you know, you have to foul him and you want to foul him, but you got to catch him. You got to catch him is right. And the other thing is he's not going to give the ball up unless he's at least double teamed because he wants to be the guy on the line. Aachen hits the first free throw, big one. Like I said, he's always a little more comfortable when he's shooting two. Makes them both. Wow. So John Becker's strategy to foul him didn't work. Eight of 13 from the line for Aachen. That's a very good Dreamers night will for take him. that every day of the week. Yep. Patella can't convert. Second time they penetrated, had a chance to score a three-point play in the last, what, 30 seconds. Yeah. Couldn't convert. And the layup that I will remember is the one Ryan Davis missed, wide open, with a lot of time still left. And Three, they, they ended up not scoring on that possession. Three key points in the second half. The early foul on Davis, Horvath's the Horvath offensive rebound, the Davis miss. Yep. And 
Robin Duncan back in. Davis sits down. Robin Duncan has hardly played tonight, which is unusual. He usually plays about 20 minutes a night. Yeah, he played 20 plus last night. Oh. Well, the Retriever's just 35 seconds away from winning a share of the conference crown, regular season, and being home for the semifinals. We know that going in, and now potentially with a win in the semis, get home court for the final. Yeah, and again, if you gotta play Vermont a third time, you'd rather do it here. Last year when they played Vermont in the semifinals, because COVID was just starting, they were not allowed to fly. They had to bus, which is a long bus trip. Love to play any of the playoff games, semis, finals, whatever, with fans. <laughs> yeah. Don't don't know, nice. don't think, but would love it. And they will appeal to Governor Hogan on that. His arm must be getting tired from shooting so many free throws. You know, one of the big things we really haven't talked about too much this year, John, we haven't actually done that many games, unfortunately. You know, Rogers only played seven games last year. Right. He missed the final 26. He's been healthy and available throughout this season. I had a shooting slump in the middle of, uh, of the season there. I had that one weekend where he... Against Hartford. Against Hartford, where he's like 0 for 14 from three. But you're right, him being available has certainly mattered a lot, and that should be it. That'll I don't do think it. John Becker will They'll call it tell off his here. players to foul. And the Retrievers will come back and win the second of two against the Vermont Catamounts. The teams now will tie for the America East Conference regular season championship, and by tiebreaker, UMBC gets home court throughout. And Potentially the first championship game in the America East to be played here in Catonsville since 2008 that if they correct. get to the final. And how about this, John? Since 2016-17, the first year that Ryan Odom was with UMBC, Vermont has lost a total, a grand total, of 10 conference games in five years, five of them to against UMBC. UMBC. A team that couldn't beat Vermont for years and years. 23 game losing It, it all changed when Jarris Lyles made that shot in Patrick Jim. Here you see the standings. UMBC first with a tiebreaker. Vermont also gets the double bye. Hartford does not get to play this weekend. If New Hampshire wins at Lowell, New Hampshire will be third. They will get a bye. And whoever is fourth will play Binghamton. Whoever is fifth will play, well, we don't know who they'll play at this point, but only one team will get one by. UMBC and Vermont will get two. And really not fair to Hartford to not get to even play. If you play and you lose, that's one thing. But because it's such a crazy season with COVID, they're getting the short end of the stick schedule-wise. Well, balance scoring for UMBC as usual with four players in double digits. And RJ Idlerock led the way, John, with 15 for UMBC. RJ Idlerock, who led the way last night in the loss, and as you said, was kind of quiet in the first half. But there's a three he made that was part of stopping the early run by Vermont in the first half, and in, in the second half, at the start of the second half. And he has really become an offensive threat, which is what he was at the first two years. He's a great defender, great rebounder. But here you see neither team shot the ball especially well uh, tonight. Uh, again, Vermont, which was 10 of 21 shooting threes last night, four of 22 tonight. Um, and three of those four were, were made by their center. Um, everybody else shot poorly from the outside. Vermont missed four three throw, free throws. UMBC 23 of 32. Turnover is important, bench points, absolutely critical. But I really think the one thing you can't show on stats is the inside defense that UMBC played tonight. They did, a, they did a great job stopping guys from driving. They did not give up offensive rebounds throughout the game. And they got out on shooters better than they did uh, last night. Well, this one in the books now. UMBC beats Vermont. Let's take a look at the brackets as they are right at the moment. And right now, Hartford is the third seed. It, that would flip with New Hampshire. If New Hampshire were to win tomorrow night, they would play the 4-9 game, and New Hampshire would go on to that three line. And this is one of those tournaments where you really don't know round to round who you're going to play because they reseed after each round. 
So UMBC will play the lowest remaining seed in the tournament in the semifinals. Vermont will play the other team in the semifinals. And then whomever advances, if UMBC advances, they will play in the championship game here. Now the playoffs will start next weekend. Let's take a look at what's going on this weekend, starting tomorrow. A lot of meaningful basketball still left to play in the conference. There's no doubt about it. As we mentioned, that New Hampshire uh, Mass Lowell game, where New Hampshire could get that first bye uh, in, the, in the first round. Binghamton's going to be the ninth seed. All those teams in the middle, NJIT, Stony Brook, Albany, they could all move up in the seedings with wins. Uh, the only team that's not going to move up is Binghamton. All right, so that'll do it from the UMBC Event Center. A big first half for Keandre Kennedy tonight and a big second half for RJ Idlerock with 11 points down the stretch. UMBC beats Vermont here. 66-55 is the final. For John Feinstein, I'm Gary Stein saying so long from UMBC. All games airing on the ESPN networks are streaming live and archived on the ESPN app. It's been a pleasure being with you this season, this regular season, and we'll be back on the 6th of March when the Retrievers take on, we don't know who yet, but they will play somebody in the semifinal right here at the Event Center. This has been a presentation of ESPN. Have a great night, a great weekend from Frosty Baltimore. Best wishes to all.